I wonder how many of you came out of curiosity. See who these two preachers are. I clip articles. I'm going to read a little bit from this one. It was uh, an article written by Gordon Hancock, but he is really quoting Evelyn Cunningham. And I'm not going to read all that, but she talks about going to church one Sunday. She said, the service started with the psalms, the hymnals, and the sermon. The lady sitting next to me was thoughtful enough to whisper the number of the pages they were reading from so I could keep up with everything. I was interested in the announcements that they had midway in the service. It seemed there was going to be an NAACP meeting in the parish, tea for sit-ins, the register and vote committee was looking for volunteers, a mental health clinic was going to be open, and the Little League baseball team needed uniforms. Good, I thought. The church was reaching out into the community and assuming broader responsibilities. Then came the sermon. I never quite got the full point, but it was all about the space race and the Africans. It was interesting, but I kept thinking that it would have sounded better at a banquet or at one of those testimonials. Something I didn't know what just was not right. As a backslider, I was not in a position to question the church's modus operandi and had no way of knowing if this service was any different from the others over the past years. But it occurred to me during collection that I'd missed what was real religious impact. They didn't talk enough about God and all the things that had brought me there. They gave me plenty of inspiration to do my duty as a citizen and to help the race in the march of progress. They gave me pride in the church's community center and an earnest desire to volunteer for after-school programs. But they did not give me the spirit I was looking for. They did not stir my soul. They did not make me want to repent. It was a good town hall meeting, but it wasn't church. Yeah, that's what someone wrote. Now, I have no desire to keep up a big mystery about these two preachers. I want to clear the air right away. Who are these two great preachers that quit going to church in Washington, D.C.? First of all, I want to tell you they were the most powerful preachers in the world. Both of them were good friends. As a matter of fact, we could call them brothers. In all their existence, they never had a disagreement in all the years. Their names, the Testament Brothers. Their first names, old and new. <laughs> and if you think my personification is way out, you ought to read what the Bible says. In Revelation 11:3. it talks about two witnesses and uses personification, the Old and New Testament. Would you say amen out there? Amen. Together they comprise 66 books of the Bible, 1,189 chapters, 31,173 verses, 773,746 words, and 3,566,400 letters in the authorized version. All of this goes to make up the Old and New Testament, and all of it together is the Word of God. Would you say amen out here? Two greatest preachers in all the universe, the Old Testament and the New Testament, these brothers. When Jesus was here, Old Testament was all by himself. He didn't have a brother. But Old Testament loved Jesus and said wonderful things about him. Now, this is good for dispensationalists who think the Old Testament was nailed to the cross. When Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they testify of me, the only scriptures extant were the Old Testament. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, you need to think tonight. I'm going to rush on through. I say Old Testament preached Jesus before Jesus was born. Old Testament even named the town he would be born in, Micah 5, 2 to 7. But out of thee, O Bethlehem, Ephrata. That's like saying, out of thee, Washington, D.C. Bethlehem was in Ephrath. And lest it be confused with Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, the Bible says, out of thee, Bethlehem, Ephrata, or Bethlehem of Ephrath, shall he come forth unto me. And by the way, Mary and Joseph didn't live in Bethlehem. They lived in Nazareth. And yet the Bible, way back in the Old Testament times, 
hundreds of years before Christ was born, named the very town he'd be born in. Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. He saw it because he believed the Old Testament. Would you say amen out there? I want to tell you something else that might be foreign to your ears. The Old Testament was a mighty preacher of grace. In the book of Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, it starts off by saying that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Adam and Eve were supposed to be utterly destroyed after disobeying God. But way back in Genesis chapter 3, way back at the beginning of sin, God killed two animals and said to Adam and Eve, the shedding of the blood of this innocent victim typifies the blood of Jesus that will be shed to cover the sin that you've sinned today so that you can be saved in my kingdom. And if we get to heaven, Adam and Eve are going to be there through grace. Would you say amen? Not only that, but old preach love. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, he said, you got to love your neighbor as yourself. And in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, old said, you got to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when Jesus said that in Mark 12 and verse 30, he was simply quoting old. Amen. I want you to follow me now. With every sacrifice that was made, every time a lamb died, every time a goat died, every time a pigeon died, every time a dove died in Old Testament times, old was preaching Jesus. Because everything that shed its blood on the sacrificial altar pointed to the Lamb of God who would come and shed his blood for the sins of the whole world. Old was saying, look forward to Christ. One day, along came new. And by the way, some of you would be surprised to know that new didn't come when Jesus came. And new didn't come when Jesus died. And new didn't come when Jesus rose. It was years later before they began to write. And some say that Mark was the first book written. Are you listening to me? And the scholars have come to the closest figure agreeing on about 20 to 22 years after Christ had gone back to heaven, Mark wrote the book of Mark. Do you hear me? So there was no New Testament on the day of Pentecost. There was no New Testament when Paul was converted. There was no New Testament for several years. And that needs to be made clear. Because folks say, well, you know, when Jesus died, things changed. Well, they did not change. He said, I am the Lord, I change not. He said, think not that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. I did not come to change my word. Would the church say amen out there? Now, if he had changed it, if he had come up with another Sabbath, or if he'd done away with his law, or anything else, the disciples had at least 22 years to find out, so that when they started writing, they could tell us. Amen? But eventually along came new. And new had been on its way for a long time. New came long after the Jews had killed the Lord, and Jesus had been raised from the dead, and had gone back to heaven still, Old and new, these two brother preachers met at the cross and shook hands. Would you say amen? amen? Old had pointed forward to the cross. Now new points back to the cross. And all people of both dispensations have to meet at the cross of Jesus. And if we go to heaven, we're all going because of the cross. Adam and Eve are not going because of any goat or any bull. They are going because Jesus died on the cross. All that goat did was point forward to Jesus. It was Adam's way of saying, Lord, I appreciate what you've done in making a provision for my sins. And I'm looking forward to the Messiah. When Abraham was killing those animals, he was simply saying, Lord, I'm so glad you've made a way. And one day your son is going to come and ratify that covenant with the human family. Every time they killed an animal, they pointed forward to Jesus. New Testament came along later and pointed back to Jesus. And I want to say it again. These two brothers met at the cross, shook hands, and have never had a disagreement since. Together, they testify of Christ. Together, they talk about grace. Together, they hold up the law of God. Together, they condemn sin. Together, they proclaim judgment. Would you say amen out there? 
Now let's pick up a few instances. Old, and remember I'm calling these preachers by their first names. Old said in Isaiah 118, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And yet there are people who say there's nothing but wrath and law in the Old Testament. Here in the Old Testament, God is saying, come now. I'll take your sins and wash them in the blood of the Lamb and make you as pure as snow. Well, did new disagree with old? No, sir. In 1 John 1, 9, he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Would you say amen? Now, the New Testament said in Matthew 19 and, and verse 17, Love thy neighbor as thyself. Old Testament had preached that hundreds of years before in Leviticus 19, 18. The New Testament said in Matthew 22, 37, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. Old Testament said that's nothing new. We agree. I said that hundreds of years before Jesus was born in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. The Old Testament said in Psalms 19 and verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Well, people say New Testament is against the law. Let's see, in Romans 7 and verse 12, New said, The law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Would you say amen, beloved? Old said in Deuteronomy 7 9, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments. Along came new hundreds of years later. And in John 14, 15, he said, If ye love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Old said in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 16, I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, that thou mayest live. The Lord thy God will bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. New came along and said virtually the same thing in Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. I ask you now, do you see the harmony between these brothers? Somebody has taught that the Old Testament was wrath and the New Testament is love. The Old Testament only dealt with severe punishments and judgments. The New Testament only deals with love because Jesus has come. Well, let's see if they disagree. The New Testament speaks in the most beloved text in all the Bible, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, that's the pretty part. But there's a part in there we miss. That whosoever believeth in him should not what? Right there, the New Testament is talking about folks who are going to do what? Perish. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Who said New didn't talk about wrath and punishment and judgment? In John 3 and verse 36, New said, He that believeth not on the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. Would you say amen, beloved? And way over in the last book of the New Testament, Revelation chapter 16, we read to you the other night of bloody water, Boils and blisters, the most severe plagues that have ever struck the earth. In fact, the Bible says a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And it's found in the New Testament. The wrath of God against sinners, against disobedient, willfully impenitent sinners. Now, ladies and gentlemen, who dares say there's no wrath in the New Testament? In John 20 and verse 9, the Bible says fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Old Testament said water came down and drowned them. Fire is going to be more severe than water. Would you say amen out there? Who says there's no wrath in the New Testament? In Revelation 14, 10, and 11, the Bible speaks of those who get the mark of the beast who are going to be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoso receiveth the mark in his name, uh, the mark or the number of his name. Would you say amen, beloved? I hope tonight that this novel idea will present to you the harmony of the Bible and the other fallacies that are being taught and preached in Washington, D.C. 
no wrath in the new. We've just taken care of that. And I could read and read and read where God says punishment will come to sinners. And those who commit perversions shall receive the judgment of God. And that all liars and whoremongers and adulterers shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. And every bit of that comes out of the New Testament. Who said there's no wrath in the new? Now on the other hand, who was it who said there's no love in the old? It was old who said, come now, let's reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make you white as snow. It was the Old Testament that said, can a woman forget her suckling child? Yea, she may forget, yet will I not forget thee. The Lord is comparing his love to a mother's love and suggesting that his love is superior even to that of a mother for her suckling child. In Hosea chapter 14, the Lord said, Turn, O backsliding children, for I am married unto you. He said, If you turn, I will heal your backsliding and love you freely. Oh, if you're a backslider out there, you ought to say amen. Let me interpret that. I will love you freely. Jesus said, I'll heal the backsliding, and you won't have to pay any money. You won't have to make up anything because you can't anyhow. I will take your backsliding away and I'll love you freely, meaning I'll treat you like you never backslid in the first place. Who says there's no love in the Old Testament? As a matter of fact, Isaiah is called the gospel prophet. And nobody paints a more pathetic picture of the suffering Lord to come than Isaiah did in chapter 53. It was he who said he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, and acquainted with grief. Surely he hath borne our griefs and, and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Who said there's no love in the Old Testament? Now, beloved, old and new are brothers. And they preach the same thing. And neither of them likes it when folk try to separate it, separate them, and kneel one of them to the cross. Old didn't like it, and new doesn't like it. New said in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture, how much? Is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. How much of it is good for instruction in righteousness? All scripture. How much of it is good for doctrine? All scripture. How much of it is good for reproof and correction? All scripture. The Bible says so. It says that the man of God might be perfect. Truly, that word could be translated thoroughly, furnished unto all good works. When Jesus was here, Old was all Jesus had. And if you look in your Bible, beloved, especially if you have a red letter edition, if you were to take a pencil and paper and write down everything Jesus said in the New Testament, you would discover to your surprise that roughly 10% of every word Jesus spoke is simply quoting the Old Testament. Would you say amen out there? That's why I like Jesus as my model. He was a Bible preacher. He was what kind of preacher? If the preachers of today who preach for an hour would use 10% of that time with the Word of God, the churches would be different and the truth would be clearer and people would be reproved and not sitting up in church practicing every conceivable filth. The Word of God has power in it. And when Christ preached, 10% of everything he said that's written in the Bible is a direct quotation of Scripture. Jesus is the one who said in John 5, 39, search the Scriptures. And, and, and the understood subject is you. You search the Scriptures. And that's not a suggestion. It's an imperative. Search, you search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. They are they that testify of me. And the only scriptures he had in mind were the Old Testament because that's all there was. Amen. In John 17, 17, Jesus prayed to his father and said, Sanctify them through truth. Thy word is truth. And the only Bible Jesus had was the Old Testament. Would you say amen? 
in John 5, 46 and 47. And this one you ought to write down and put a star behind it. You ought to underline it in your Bible because you hear more foolishness. Frankly, beloved, I'm not trying to be funny. Sometimes when I hear things that are taught from the pulpit, I wonder what my brethren are reading and where on earth they get it. Now listen, Jesus said in John 5, 46 and 47, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? I want everybody to say amen. amen. Now the Lord said that, not Brooks. Jesus said it himself. In Matthew 24 and verse 35, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And the only word he had at that time was the Old Testament. And in John 10 and verse 35, Jesus said, the scriptures cannot be broken. And the only scripture he had was the Old Testament. In Matthew 22 and verse 29, Jesus said, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. In Romans 16 and verse 17, Paul said, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's say amen. And all they had was the Old Testament. In John 15 and verse 3, Jesus said, Now are ye clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Amen. And he is the one who inspired the prophets. He is the one who gave the law on Mount Sinai. He said, You are clean through the word. Oh, there's power in the Word. Now, I'm not talking about some kind of mystical magic. I'm talking about the Word of God when you receive it, like someone receiving bread and eating it and digesting it. There's power in it, just like there's strength in bread. Now, you can have a house full of bread, but if you don't eat it, you'll starve to death. Isn't that right? But if you eat it, it'll make you strong. Make you strong and fill you with energy. And the Bible says the Word will also make you clean. It'll clean you up. You get all these ideas from the doctors. I got some questions and I wish I could answer them, but I don't want to read them. But you've got medical men representing uh, uh, high professions and they are encouraging self-abuse. And that's what the question is about. You older ones know what I'm talking about. Well, now you've got to read the Bible in order to be clean because we tend to trust doctors. And we should be able to. And we tend to trust preachers. I've got an article in my Bible right now where a bishop of a certain church got up and said that extramarital sex was just a form of communication and there was nothing wrong with it. No more than oral communication. And he said it at a convention of preachers. And they put it in the newspaper. That's what makes it public knowledge. And that's why I don't mind mentioning it to you. I've got the article right here in my Bible. I don't seem able to put my hand on it. But if you want me to read it to you, you ask me and I'll read it to you. Now, you hear a preacher say that, a big preacher, and you read it in the newspaper, your mind will get dirty because you'll say, well, it must be all right. The flesh wants you to enjoy it anyway. But you got to read the Bible in order to be clean. And if you read the Bible, you will read where the Lord said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit fornication. For all who do it are an abomination in the sight of the Lord. you got to read the Bible and trust that and it will make you clean. Heard about a woman who wasn't very learned. And she went to church all the time and she rejoiced in it. And her son, who was a smart aleck, was making fun of her. Said, Mother, you always talk about the Word of God. You don't even know it. You can't quote it. You can't even read. And the mother got fed up with him, and she said, boy, come here. And she took a clothes hamper and set it out on the ground. She said, now, I'm telling you to get a pail of water and pour it in that hamper, and you keep on doing it till I tell you to stop. Well, he got the first pail, and he dumped it in there, and you know it ran right through the hamper. And he poured in another, and he got tired, and he, she said, you keep it up. And he kept on pouring the water in until finally he'd poured 20 buckets of water in an empty hamper. And when he finished, she said, now look at it. Is that hamper full? Why oh, no, he said, it's not full. It all ran out. She said, but it sure is cleaner. I might not have all the wisdom and all the knowledge to retain everything, but it makes me cleaner. Amen. 
on the road to Emmaus, or Emmaus as you might call it, in Luke chapter 24 and verse 25, Jesus had risen from the dead. Here were two disciples walking along, disconsolate and discouraged. They had seen Jesus die. They were scared for their own necks. The end of the world had come, so to speak. And all of a sudden, the Lord started walking with them, and they didn't even know him. And you know what Jesus said to them? And I want you to get this. The Bible says Jesus called them fools. He said, oh, fool. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written. And in verse 27, it says that Christ, beginning at Moses, beginning where? He began with Moses. Now, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. That's about as early as you can begin. Now, scholars will tell you that the book of Job is the oldest book, but Moses wrote that. So the Bible says, Jesus began at Moses. He began where? And with all the prophets, he expounded unto them the things which the scriptures said about himself. Would you say amen? He went all the way back to the book of Genesis where God said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed. Thou shalt bruise his heel, but he shall bruise thy head. Jesus said, that was me. I came down here to bruise the head of the devil and you're discouraged because he bruised my heel the wound is only temporary I died but I'm alive again but when I take care of the devil he will never live again and affliction shall not rise up the second time and he went through the prophecies the Bible says all the prophecies and expounded unto them the things which the scriptures said about himself he began at Moses. Now, if that was good enough for Jesus, there's nothing wrong with it for me. Would you say amen out there? Now, not only that, but when Jesus was tempted, I want you to get this. You can read it in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. It's all through the Bible. When Jesus was tempted on the Mount of Temptation, the devil came to him and said, Lord, if you be the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Now, the Lord could have fallen into the devil's trap. He got Adam and Eve on appetite, didn't he? And Jesus is the second Adam. He came to succeed where Adam failed. And had he given in to this kind of temptation, he would have sinned. And so the Lord answered the devil. He said, it is written. It is what? He didn't say, here is my opinion. He didn't say, I've got a new light on this subject. He didn't say, as someone wrote last night, the Holy Spirit brings me fresh information contrary to what the Bible says. Jesus said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. By how many words? And if you read Exodus chapter 20, where the commandments are given, it says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, and so forth. Every word, not nine, all ten. Would you say amen out there? Now, the Bible says it is written. Well, where is it written? In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3, Christ was simply quoting Scripture. And that's the best thing for you to do when the devil comes up with his excuses and comes up with his error and comes up with his tradition and comes up with his so-called changes. The best thing for you to do is know the Scripture. And if you've been taking down the texts, you got it. Let's say amen out there. And if you don't know it, then require those who bring it to show you what they brought from the Bible. If you don't remember the text that I've given you, just say to the preacher, you show me in the Bible where I'm supposed to do it, and I'll do it. And then put the burden of proof on him. Well, the devil heard the Lord quoting Scripture, and he decided to quote some. What he really did was misquote Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12, about the angels taking charge of you. He was tempting Christ to presumption. He said, cast yourself down. Nothing's going to happen. If you're the Son of God, angels will catch you. You won't even get hurt. We're not supposed to tempt God like that. You're not going to find me handling any rattlesnakes. God didn't tell me to do that. Now, if I go out there among some snakes and one of them hits me, the Lord will protect my life, and he's done that already. Let's say amen out there. But I'm not going to be presumptuous going out hunting rattlesnakes and holding them up and kissing them and all that to prove I got faith. Uh-uh, I ain't kissing any snake. This is the way the devil tempted the Lord, and there's ego involved there. And the Lord said, Satan, it is written. Now, the devil was misquoting the Bible, and make no mistake, he knows the Bible. Revelation chapter 12 says he's come down unto you having great wrath because he knows he's got but a short time. Now, he wants you to think you've got a lot of time, but he knows his time is running out, and he is furious trying to get everybody he can to be lost with him. 
Let's say amen out there. Devil knows the Bible. Don't you think that you are a child of God because you know the Bible? Devil knows it. Don't you think you're a child of God just because you go to church? Devil goes. Don't you think you're a child of God just because you uh, sing in the choir? Devil got started in the choir. Amen. So he misquotes the Bible and Jesus said to him, It is written second time and Christ didn't trust his opinion again. He reached back and got the scriptures again and he said, Satan, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Where did he get that? Deuteronomy 6.16. Quoting the Bible. That's the best thing to do when the devil's on your trail. Starts telling you you can't make it. And you know how weak you are. You'll get this girl. Oh, I'm so weak. Uh-uh. Tell him through Christ I can do all things. It is written, Satan. Start telling you about your dirt that you did before you became a Christian. Tell him it is written. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. Devil knows it's in there. Remind him and he'll flee from you. He can't stand the word. It's like a sword, a two-edged sword that gets hung up in his gut and he takes off. He wants no part of Jesus. He met Jesus in heaven and lost. Met him at the cross and lost. Let's say amen. Met him on the Mount of Temptation and lost. Whoever holds on to the hand of Jesus is on a winning team. Devil knows he can't beat Jesus. And when you start quoting Jesus, devil leave you alone. Took Christ up on a high mountain, showed him the kingdom of the world. Told him, now I've read the Bible, I know why you're here. You've come to purchase this back or redeem it. Now if you just worship me once, I'll give it to you. Jesus said, it is written, Deuteronomy 6.13, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Ephesians 6.17 says, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Let's say amen out there. Now the devil hates these two preachers, old and new. You know why he hates them? Because the Bible says in Psalms 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin. Now the devil wants you to sin. And if you read the Bible and trust the Bible and pray to God as the Bible says, you can be kept from sin. Let's say amen. You need the word here in your heart. Jesus said, I'll write it in your mind on the fleshly tables of your heart so that when you're tempted and think, you will think what the word says. Devil knows that's a safety guard. He knows that's a guarantee. He knows that's a refuge. He knows that's security against sin. That's why he hates old and new. And when he turns you against the old, he doesn't love the new either. He hates it because those who hide God's word in their hearts live victorious lives through faith. Today, these two great preachers don't go to church very much. They lie around in hotel rooms, on coffee tables. You know, we give away these big, beautiful Bibles and some folk will take them home and take the cover off and put them out on the table so company can see them. Never read them. One day a little girl was helping her mother do the housework and dust was all over the Bible and she started dusting it off. She said, Mother, whose book is this? Oh, she said, Honey, that's God's book. She said, Well, why don't you give it back to him? Nobody here uses it. <laughs> now, I tell you, there's more to that than a chuckle. Amen. I tell you, these two preachers don't go to church as they ought to go to church. They're at home on coffee tables. In closets, amongst the family souvenirs, only thing they're good for is to have the marriage and death records of the members of the family. People go to church and get out of their cars with fancy hats and flowers, and do dangy dresses, expensive handbags, umbrellas. Meat, chewing gum, tambourines, guitars and jazz, dance, candy to eat during the service, immodest clothes, 
see-through blouses, jokes, all of that stuff goes to church. But the Bible stays home on the coffee table. Luther fought the devil with the word of God. Luther records that one day in his study, the devil appeared in person and had a list of Luther's sins. And he was trying to discourage him with it, and he was covering up something with his hand. And Luther said, all right, show me that, and that you got covered up. And when he pulled his hand away, it was the promise of forgiveness through Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, Luther said he threw his ink well at the devil. I tell you, devil's no match for you when you stand on the word. And when Christ is Lord in your life, let's say amen out there. John Wesley shook Europe and America with the word of God. And that's the only thing that's going to make a difference in people. I could be down here preaching every night and I could say all kinds of wonderful things about patriotism and communism and, and human rights and civil rights. I could talk to you until I was pink in the face. It's not going to change the heart. The only thing that the Holy Ghost can use to appeal to men and change sinners into saints is the Word of God. Would you say amen out there? But today in church there's social doctrine and numerality and situational ethics and space and the things of the flesh. And Martin Luther said a whole sermon is not worth one text. And Jesus said in John 6:63, 6, the spirit quickeneth. But the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And St. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 23, you got to be born of the word. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we need more than the newspaper. We need more than Time magazine. We need more than the U.S. News and World Report. You can read those to find out what people are doing. But if you want to find out what people ought to be doing, you got to read the Word of God. Would you say amen? And I want to tell you something tonight I hope you'll never forget. A sermon isn't worth very much until it tells you what's wrong with you. That's why I've told my... And I love you folks. But I'm leveling with you. If my sermons only make you feel good, there's something wrong with my preaching. For the first work of the Holy Ghost is to convince the world of sin. And the first thing the Holy Spirit wants to do with you is show you where you're walking wrong. Now Jesus said that. Then the second work is to convince the world of righteousness. It shows you where you're walking wrong, but it also shows you how you can get straightened out and walk in the light. Let's say amen out there. So the sermon that is best for you is the one that steps on your toes. So don't be sensitive and don't take it out on me. And certainly don't take it out on the Lord. God's doing you a favor when he tells you how nasty and how filthy and how mean your practices are. You won't repent until he shows you that. And a man who preaches the truth is not going to rub your fur the right way all the time. He's going to cut across the grain. Sometimes you're going to squirm in your seat. A dear sister called me today, a wonderful person. I could tell on the phone. And she said to me, Pastor, the other night you really got on me. But she was smiling. You could hear it in her voice. Glad to hear the word of God. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. I look in the word of God to see what's wrong with me. And every day I'm asking the Lord to bring my life into harmony with his word. Would you say amen out there? And like the spiritual says, I got a long way to go to be like the Lord. But I'm working on it. I ain't what I ought to be, but I'm not what I used to be. And the Word of God has made the difference, church. A sermon that helps the soul is a sermon that shows you you're wrong and then shows you there's mercy with the Lord. Sometimes these things we preach are hard. And I tell the Lord when I have to preach that kind of thing, Lord, don't let me leave people out there without hope. Let me say something so that a man living with a woman out of wedlock, so that a man who is taking dope, so that a man who is a thief and breaking in cars, let me say something to that man that he might know there's mercy with the Lord and he doesn't have to live that way, that there is power in the blood and that there is a God somewhere who can take a sinner and make a saint out of him just like you did me. Let's say amen out there. Your sermon's got to do that too. People should not go away feeling they can't make it. Oh, yes, you can. There's somebody more interested in your salvation than you are. 
And that somebody has the power to make the difference. Would you say amen out there? The Word of God will straighten out your problems. Don't get mad at it. Don't no good telling people the sermon didn't move you. Might not be the sermon's fault. Amen. St. Paul was preaching one night. Young man was sitting in the window, didn't have his mind on the subject, went to sleep, fell out, hit the ground, and died. His name was Eutychus. Paul had to go down there and bring him back to life. Wasn't a sermon's fault. Same sermon that doesn't move you is moving somebody. Let's say amen. While some are fussing and squirming and kicking against the pricks, others are saying, oh Lord, I come, I come. Same sermon. The sun melts wax and hardens clay. Problem ain't the sun. It's the substance of the wax and the clay. If your heart is vulnerable and, and to the impress of the Holy Ghost, and if you're not impervious to the voice of God, the sermon will do you good, and the Holy Ghost then will move you. You look at a telescope, all you see is a telescope. But if you look through a telescope, you will see the wonders of God in outer space. You got to do more than look at the Word. You got to look in the Word. And you got to seek for Jesus in that Word. He said, search, for they are they that testify of me. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, he said, young man, preach the Word. Preach the Word! Somebody's got to talk about civil rights, but let them do that down at City Hall. You preach the word. Now, I'm a man that has stood up for my people. I don't have to brag about it. And I admired men like Dr. King and others, and I supported them financially. And I did what I could, but God didn't call me to do that. I believe God raised that man up to do what he did. Sure, I believe it. He was a good man. I sat and listened to him in person time and time again. I shook his hand. We chatted together. Now, we weren't friends. I'm not trying to say that. I mean close acquaintances, but we knew each other. And, and when I listened to him, I heard him stand up and tell us in the heat and the flame of all that irritation and agitation, he said, love your enemies. Don't let anybody drag you so low as to make you hate them. If they smite one cheek, turn the other. That's the word of God. I believe God raised him up. But God called me to preach the word. And that's what Paul said to Timothy. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. What does that mean? It means preach the word all the time. Preach it in the pulpit. Preach it in the street. Preach it in the folks' homes. Wherever you find sin, put to the word. In season. Out of season. Preach it when folks don't want to hear it and when they do want to hear it. Then he said reprove. And rebuke. What does that mean? If a man is doing wrong and doesn't know any better, reprove him. That means correct him. But if a man is doing wrong and knows it, rebuke that rascal. Don't let him be comfortable coming to church, dropping his money in, thinking he can get away with murder. Tell him he's going to hell unless he changes. Rebuke him. And then the third thing Paul said was exhort. And I like that. After you reprove and correct, after you rebuke and straighten folks out, then he said, exhort them. Let them know that Jesus loves them. Let them know that there's help somewhere. Let them know that Christ is willing to save them and to change them and to convert them and to take them home to heaven. Exhort the people. Would you say amen? The Bible says, but be ye doers of the word. This is James 1, 22 and 25. Let's take the lights down now, please. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Would you say amen? You got to do more than just listen to the word. You got to have enough faith in God to thank him for it and believe in it. Then you got to do the word. Two little boys went out one day to play in the park and they were having a good time. It was a bright sunny day. And finally, you know how little boys are. One of them said to the other, I bet I can stare at the sun longer than you can. The other one said, I bet you can. So they stretched out on their backs. Said, all right, get set, go. And they looked up at the sun. And they laid there staring at the sun until those violent rays did almost irreparable damage to their eyes. When they got home, their eyes were swelled. Pain was shooting through their heads. Had to call the doctor. Put them in the hospital for about four days. Covered their eyes up with pads and soaked them with solutions. And by a miracle of grace, when they took them off, those boys could see again. 
when they got ready to go home, the doctor said, Fellas, let that be a lesson to you. Light ain't made to stare at, it's made to walk in. Who'd you say amen out there? Some of y'all come out here just to stare at the light. There's a preacher down there that preaches out of the Bible. Let's go listen, see what he'll say. Let's go look at him. Let's go stare at the light. Light ain't made to stare at. Made to walk in. God's going to hold you responsible for every sermon you've heard. And he wants his word to be in you seed that will spring up in good ground and bear fruit. So you ought to pray that your heart will be good ground, not stony ground. He also spoke of some of it falling in the shallow ground. Not enough roots, you know. There's some people in the heat of an effort or heat of a campaign. In the heat of a sermon, they're ready to go to heaven. Two weeks later, they cooled off. Shallow. Soon as the devil starts fighting, they give up. Shallow. You need good ground so that when the wind blows, you're there. When trials come, you're standing on the promises. When the devil rages in his fury and the storms of life are buffeting your soul, you're standing on the solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand. That's the kind of experience you need. And the kind you ought to pray for tonight. Now, beloved, the Bible says all Scripture is given by what? And in 2 Peter 1, 21, it says, Holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And this is what Washington needs tonight. This is what we need. All this rotten crime. Somebody told me tonight, a little 13-year-old girl got off a bus or something over here and, and, and some fellas got her and abused her and then shot her full of dope and kept her doped up until she said she was hooked and now she's on the streets as a prostitute. That's the kind of world we're living in. That kind of world needs the Word of God. And what are people doing? Laughing at God's Word and belittling it. Won't believe it and even churches don't use it. Get up and read one text and shut the Bible. My text this morning is, shut the Bible and the rest of it is man. Jesus said when you're talking to folks, folk about sin, it's here a little and there a little, line upon line and precept upon precept. Study the Word of God. That's what we need. That's what young people need. The reason I put that slide on the screen is that black fellow there is our pianist, Brother Kilby, when he was a young boy. He was the artist model. We need the Word of God in these dangerous times. When some fool could set off a nuclear holocaust. You need to stand on the Word. Then you won't fear. You go to bed at night and sleep like a baby. The Word of God is like an anvil. It wears out the hammers, but the anvil stands. All of these old hammers who don't believe and who laugh and who ridicule and scoff, all of them are worn out. Their philosophy falls to the ground. This so-called new morality of the 60s and early 70s has produced streets full of amoral nitwits. Young people who are not worth a dime mentally, morally, or physically. The hammers are worn out. Some of them are saying tonight, it didn't work. But the Word of God keeps on standing forever. Let's say amen, beloved. And the Word of God is the only bridge that's going to get us into holiness and into the kingdom of God. The Bible says without holiness, you're not going to see God. Jesus said, if you'd believe Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. And that next verse says, if you didn't believe him, you're not going to believe me. And yet people trying to cut the Bible up into parts. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Not Pastor Brooks's good idea. Or his opinion. Your opinion is as good as mine. But when it comes to the word, that's lifted out of the realm of humanity. That has to do with the eternal God. And that's the truth. And it'll set you free. Free from sin. Free from habits. Free from misunderstanding. Free from ignorance based on human philosophy. The Bible says, let no man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. The only thing going to straighten your head out is the Word of God. It'll set you free. Would you say amen? We need to study it. Young people need it. Parents need to read it to children who can't even read yet. The name of Jesus will make an impression on a baby in arms. 
you ought to hold that baby in your arms and say, Jesus, bless my child. And let that child grow up hearing you call the name of Jesus from the Word of God. Need to study the Bible, for the Bible presents Christ. And without Him, there is no hope. So there's my sermon, folks, on these two great preachers. Didn't turn out the way you thought, did it? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. The Word of God must be put ahead of everything. The Word of God must stand before men that we love. I know how you feel. I know how it is. Some of these men have been teaching you error. You love them. I, that's great. Well, my word, if I were your pastor, I'd want you to love me too. But I don't want to stand in conflict with the Word and you choose me over the Word. Did you hear me? The word of the Lord must become so precious to you, you're willing to die for the truth. Martin Luther King said, you're not fit to live until you find a cause for which you die. And during the dark ages, 50 millions died for the word. For the word! Because that word assured them that though they die, they'd live again. When the trumpet sounds, they're going on home with Jesus. And in that kingdom, the Bible says, there'll never be any more death. The only thing that tells you where you came from, why you're here, and where you're going is the Word of God. If you turn away from that, you'll think you came from a monkey, and that life is just all there is, and when you die, there's nothing. But when you read the Word of God, you discover you are made in the image of God, you are made for His glory, and that when He comes, you can live on forever. Only the Word of God to straighten your mind out. We need the Word of God, and we need to exalt it in our lives and in our thinking and conform to it by the power of God so that our lives are brought into harmony with the Word. You can't make the Word fit your life. God's not going to change His Word. We got to change. And there is power to change us. Now, I've told you this, and you've heard me, and I'm sincere. And if you believe that I'm sincere, I'm asking you to respond again tonight. I'm not asking anybody to follow me or my opinions, but to follow the Word of God. And the night I stop preaching the Word is the night you ought to quit coming. Haven't you heard me say that? I don't preach denominational creeds and points of view. The Word! Now the Word comes and some of us haven't known it and it suggests things that we hadn't done before. But you got to do something with the Word. Because the word is truth. And when God speaks, everything else that is counter to what God says is a lie. The word is truth. Do you love the word, folks? Do you want power to do what the word says? No matter if it's something you never knew before. Do you want me to pray for you now that you'll have the strength to walk in the word of God? If you do, I want you to stand and bow your heads. And in your heart, commit your life to the Word. And that Word will lead you to Jesus. And Jesus will lead you to the baptismal fount. And into the remnant church that stands on the Word. Oh Lord, we're standing tonight. We want to be Christians. We're tired of all this confusion. Hear one thing here and another thing there. 500 different denominations all claiming to follow Jesus. And yet all one thing here and another thing there. Thank you for the Word. And as we look at it, we pray that you'd give us the grace to follow it in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us to mean it as we stand and to make those decisions necessary in order to be saved. This is our earnest prayer, Lord, and we mean it, don't we, folks? There is hope for you because all of God's Word is true. There is hope for you. His word will guide you through. There is hope, I say, for the whole Bible is sent to you. There is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you. All his word makes sense. There is hope for you in both the Testaments. There is hope for you. His word is a sure defense. There is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you because his testaments agree. There is hope for you. They speak to you and me. 
There is hope tonight. Their truth will make us free. There is hope in Christ and in his word for you. Tomorrow night, a message you must not miss. The mark of the beast. You need to know what it is in order to know how to avoid it. Because those who get it receive the seven last plagues. Lord, bring us back safely. Please take care of these people. Keep them through the night and all day tomorrow. And bring us back tomorrow night hungering for righteousness. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you, beloved. Good night to you. And as you go home, don't forget to pray and make that commitment to your Lord. This is Pastor Charles D. Brooks. This ministry needs your support. We are dedicated to preaching the truths of God's Word clearly and giving the hearers a clear choice in these last days. If you would like to support this work, make your gifts payable to Breath of Life and send them care of American Cassette Ministries, Post Office Box 922, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Zip 17108. Thank you very much.